Hello, guys. Yes, it's going to be an interesting act to follow you guys because we are dilettantes. We went to art school. Although Monica is an engineer, I think, so that's cool. Anyway, so welcome to the weird. I'm warning designer hubris incoming on God fantasies. Who are you? Um, so, hi, I'm Monica. Uh, I am a lead designer at Northcap and I specialize in interaction and uh, service design. Uh, I have worked uh, across the globe. I did work for my previous employer in Sweden with Sanoma Ud Building. Uh, so, I know a little bit about uh, your organization. And recently, I spent uh, um, half a year working actually uh, in our Amsterdam office. Yes, I call her the magical Monica, and she truly is that. Uh, here's me. <coughs> Sorry, I have a terrible cold. I'm the head of strategy at Nordcup and I'm working in different kind of disciplines. And Nordcup is an agency that tries to do firsts. I don't like, you know, go into new things uh, when they are still, like, you know, interesting and still do practical stuff. We call this doing practical, practical futurism. And I have a daughter and also one disclaimer, I'm the husband of Rika Turunen, who's the head of privacy in Sanoma, so you can give all negative feedback to her tomorrow or something like that. So what we are, we do product design and transformation. And a lot of companies say this stuff, but yes, we are like a lot of companies, basically. But we be winning cases all around the world. We have global clients. And although we are quite small, we try to punch above our weight. But that's enough about us. Let's go to the topics. Future is present tense. Today has been really inspiring because <coughs> not a lot of these things has been like, you know, that have been discussed and presented. They're actually valid now. Especially the utopia thing was like super interesting. That it's not about you know doing betas or pilots or anything like that. It's about like making stuff happen today and making it useful today. I've been into many conferences. I was in Rise of AI a couple of weeks ago in Berlin, which is an AI conference, and already the speeches today have been better than I heard there. So kudos and well done, guys. I'm gonna break the house apparently. So why we're here, the biggest problem in our field is that this is service design <coughs> by Mark Stickdorn uh, was published in 2011 and that, that's still like the bible of service design in our, our discipline. Uh, a lot of companies also follow like these agile frameworks and these kind of things. But these things have become old and obsolete. This is 2017 and the stuff we are doing and you guys are doing are totally different and they need a lot of, lot of new tools and frameworks. And in this presentation, we're going to show you a couple of things we have been doing. And I hope you guys will find it interesting. The other thing is that, I mean, if everyone uses the same methodologies, <coughs> let's say, let's just talk about data, for instance. If you have the best, like, AI-powered data analysis tools, which will analyze, uh, let's say, your customer behavior, for instance, and then it will optimize your systems accordingly, then every company will be a clone of each other. So at some point, we need to bring a higher level of abstract, a certain level of subjectivity, perhaps, into the game. Because that, that when will uh, give us more interesting uh, interpretations of the data, and also how the company r behaves according to this data will be based on something more unique. If there's a post box, and the post box is designed optimally, then every post box will be the same. And that's something that we kind of like cons concerned about <coughs> this is basically how the frameworks have been progressing. In the beginning, <coughs> sorry, I seriously have a terrible cold. Uh, in the beginning, in let's say early 80s, we had like these waterfall things, classical way of like doing stuff and developing things. Now we're in this double or triple diamond model, which is the service design stuff. And probably in the future, and this is one of the most interesting things I've been working in in Nordcup in the past almost two years. Let's say there's a person and we do user-centered design. And then there's a service which is augmented, capable, even intelligent. Which one actually is the point of view? For whom should we design? If the service would have capabilities such as uh, reasoning, uh, making assumptions, or something like that, then actually we need to take the machine into the same fold. So we are entering at a time that design needs to be done both from the user-centric point of view, but also from the machine-centric point of view. And we are going to show you a couple examples on that. Once again, we need, to <coughs> we need a new paradigm of doing stuff. And we call this empathic machines. 
This is my favorite quote about ar artificial intelligence is by this French philosopher called Jean Bourriard. The biggest problem with artificial intelligence is that it lacks artifice and therefore intelligence. Once again, if you model and if you output the same data, you focus completely on the performance, then everything will be similar. The perception of things will be more important in the future. Making unique versions and making even mistakes, uh, having quirks, having these kind of things will become more and more important. And once again, this thing will give data, companies, products, services, tools, interactions, personality and meaning. Uh, <coughs> in our field, there's not too many like, you know, frameworks or tools sets yet. For instance, designing like personas when it comes to digital assistants. And we have been creating this. This is called the binaries. And this is a really simplified model of it. Basically, it means that, you know, let's say 30 people from the company uh, do <coughs> a set of, like, let's say 100 binaries. What is the perso persona like? What are the, like, deep, really deep characteristics of the persona? And then we, like, you know, put these things together, and make an amalgamation of it, and then we basically have a really good uh, framework on actually how the behavior should work when it comes to digital assistance. And this is interesting, and not a lot of companies do this yet, but even more interesting is this. We also do it from the machine's point of view. So we actually discover and dig out the machine's characteristics and motivations. Because the machine is, once again, augmented by some sort of intelligence, for instance. And now, this is super interesting. When you put these <coughs> things together, then, on top of each other, then you actually can find the real interesting persona-inducing interaction points and touch points. And this is actually a world first. I haven't seen anyone do this before. And when it comes to assistant design, this is a good framework. <coughs> I'm going to show you another tool. We call this XXS and Dragons because I'm a hopeless nerd and used to play Dungeon Dragons. Then we need to create a core character. <coughs> we have three, basically, like, you know, variables. Cast, class, attributes, and alignment. Oops. And then we just go, go through these things, model them, make an archetype based on these behaviors, and then find a role to the assistant. Find the significance, the place in the world for that stuff. So in a way, a personality is always part of a larger like social or interaction landscape. And this is a good tool actually to model that as well. So basically, it's not too far off from basically creating your character in role-playing games. This is a super simple way of saying it, but not too far off. And one example, I'm not going to show you any of our work, but this is something we're doing already. Uh, Finland is a small language area, and the Nordics are a small area. So imagine Alex on steroids. Something like this. Then in the last come to the ecosystem. If we're going to move mo more and more into this assistant-driven or Let's say voice UI or <coughs> conversational UI driven uh, interactions between companies and uh, the audience. It means that the old ecosystems will die. Why would you drive traffic to your website if you could summon, let's say, Helsinki Sanomat to you when you whenever you need some piece of news? Why would you bring build an app even if your interactions are happening elsewhere? And this is actually interesting, and this will <coughs> change a lot of stuff when it comes to investments and such things. So now we are working in a model where we companies build like this uh, destinations which have features. <coughs> the next stuff which already <coughs> sorry forward thinking, com thinking companies are doing is that actually th they create like this unified UI layer, such as assistants, which then, you know, work in all these touch points and, you know, drive traffic and stuff like that. So imagine the square there is a chatbot, for instance, or a personal assistant for some of a company. So, you know, your clients in all your touch points could actually like, you know, someone and be in contact with you guys without swapping apps or anything like that. Super simple. But in the future, it will be all be augmented. Oh, no, sorry, it will all be actually like made in the future. We call this sentient fragments. A piece of new news that comes from Sonoma is augmented by data and understands the context, the environment, and the users it interacts with. It's going to be linked with other fragments of content. So in a way, our like, you know, experience on the internet and digital experience will be based on these meshes of fragments, which will be augmented by intelligence, instead of being destinations such as apps, websites, or these kind of things. Uh, we see this like, you know, three to five years 
we will move here. Sorry about this hardcore interaction theory. So that's me. I was boring. Now it's time to give the mic to Monica. Thank you. So um, what it does all mean when it comes to user experience um, and when it comes to designing for user experience with the uh, AI? Um, Persona is the new brand, so uh, it's very important uh, these days to think about um, how uh, your brand makes your users feel. And uh, also when it comes to uh, AI, it's very important, like how they make, how uh, your services and product with the use of AI make uh, your users feel. Um, and AI should add uh, value to people, uh, to people's performance, not only to uh, uh, make your processes more efficient. Uh, so it, it should make uh, people's users' lives simpler, uh, more efficient, uh, and easier. Um, but uh, as all intelligent uh, entities, uh, they have uh, different uh, types of relationships uh, and also uh, there should be a relationship uh, within, uh, with the AI in order to enable uh, efficient communication. And um, uh, the relationship needs to be needs to be authentic. It cannot be a fictional one because a fictional one will uh, not uh, last. So when it comes about a uh, relationship and when it comes to AI, many people think of a butler, someone who does things for you, someone who helps you uh, accomplish different things. And it's also pretty nice if it has a voice of Scarlett Johansson like in the hair movie. But there are actually different types of uh, relationships that uh, can be considered when it comes to AI. So, uh, of course, the assistant is the one that maybe comes first to your mind. Uh, but then uh, there can be a guide, so someone that uh, basically performs a requested task for you, someone who tells you, for example, how to get from point A to point B. Uh, then we have also a coach, so someone that will give you advice, will give you motivation, uh, will give you a push when you need it. Uh, a friend, so someone who does things with you, knows you best, uh, someone who uh, can laugh with you and be for you no matter what and have your back. Uh, as well as a boss, so someone who actually tells you um, uh, what to do uh, and it's maybe a bit more of a, a decision making, has more decision making power. Uh, and all these uh, relationships uh, can uh, blurry sometimes, they, ca they can of course uh, interconnect, uh, but there is uh, one uh, very important thing that has in common in all those relationships, it's the trust. Uh, you need to trust uh, when you interact, when you have a relationship, and the users will test uh, the AI, they will uh, want to see uh, how um, uh, how much the trust is there, and it's very important to make sure that there is a, not a rivalry relationship with the user and AI. So there are also different types of uh, um, conversation or, or interactions when it comes uh, to AI and human, um, and uh, depending on what types of uh, uh, um, relationship you have, you, you will have a different response uh, or sometimes you may not have a response in uh, terms of, a, um, for example, voice or, or graphical. But for example, like when you ask Alexa switch on the lights, the light just goes on, but Alexa doesn't need to respond to you. So they are two uh, directional and the one, uh, one directional um, conversations and there has been a lot about said ab about data today already so I'm not gonna uh, dive too deep into that but what is important is from the when it comes to user experience to figure out how you're gonna use the data that you have collected uh, and how that data is also gonna uh, benefit to the user but uh, just like the intelligence uh, the data points are multi uh, dimensional and it's very important uh, to remember. So for example, today here if we look at our characteristics, uh, we can uh, char categorize people, for example, by different uh, hair color, different uh, eye color, uh, different professions, but then if we want to try to group people, 
according to those characteristics, we would have problems because there are so many interconnected uh, points. But uh, we can use AI uh, to uh, enable uh, these types of uh, groupings. Uh, and when it comes to user interface, uh, you need to make a, a quite a big decision as uh, what kind of uh, communication uh, you are going to have and um, what is what user interface is the best for as an output for that uh, inter uh, for that communication so of course we have the um, natural the the one that we know the most the graphical user interface uh, the chat uh, or the conversational user interface has been uh, now already for some time and is quite familiar for most of the people and then we have the voice user interface, whether it is in the phone or whether it is in, in a specific uh, device uh, uh, like an Alexa. Uh, so we need to look at the how different interactions from the graphical that we are familiar in the graphical user interface, how they're going to be uh, look or uh, designed in the conversational on the or the voice user interface. And the conversational user interface and the voice interface are actually quite different, uh, but they may have some uh, similarities, like for example, when it comes to information, in the graphical user interface you just browse, but in the uh, conversational user interface you, it's, it's a little bit too difficult to list all the in options that they are, and it's even more difficult in the voice. So therefore, it's very important that you need to start grouping those options. And even things like, is this thing working? So uh, in the website you and apps, you see that something is loading. You have some graphical output. You need to have that also in the conversational. You see someone is typing, the message has been delivered, or the message has been read. While in the voice you, uh, uh, user interface, you need to have some sort of emotion, like if it's on the phone, that you need to see that the Siri is listening. Or for example, in Alexa, you have a light that is on and it's alerted. Uh, so the things to remember uh, is that you need to give it a personality uh, and um, be wary of making it as close to human as possible uh, because people don't actually trust fully humans. They know that humans are faulty and uh, the recent study have been uh, shown that if the artificial intelligence is too close to human, it's, it's people still find it a little bit creepy and also they don't trust it that well. And they provide the appropriate level of information. So rather than making the users remember the things, uh, make it available for them to recall information. Uh, choose your interface wisely. Not everything has to be on the mobile and it's also not everything has to be um, in a device like Alexa. So um, there are supplemental UIs, so think about uh, what is the context and what is the output that you want to show uh, within uh, AI. And as uh, Petri said already, uh, building the empathy. So uh, AI also needs to have the successful AIs. The products that have AIs will be successful if they have emotional intelligence in them and make it inclusive. It it's should be for everyone. Everyone should know how to interact with them. <coughs> the coughing guy comes back. Anyways, uh, it's actually kind of cool. It's happening. Are we all making it? To summarize, three points I hope you get from this. One is that the personality is essential. And the personality is not just creating a personality or vocabulary to your chatbot or creating a brand book for a company, or creating a setup like, you know, interpretive, like, you know, algorithms for an AI. All of this needs to be like a holistic system in a way. And that's going to be big in the future. And that's going to be interesting to see where we go at it. That will be the separating factor between companies and actors and services. The second one, um, I would say that being, having empathy is not enough. Being empathetic is super, or expressive is super important as well. So even in a way, if you're going to script dialogues, if you're going to script narratives, interaction paths, anything like this, uh, we are going into the space where actually how the machine reacts is as important as, as the user's motivations. A quick, a quick example, 
I would access my bank uh, assistant six, six o'clock in the morning, and the back assistant would say, okay, give me two seconds, I'm just waking up, instead of giving me my number straight away. This is a very crude example. But all these micro interactions will be super important when it comes to people choosing test products and services and AI augmented service in the future. And the last one I think uh, is that uh, everything actually why is Cortana basically a human? I know the history of Cortana comes from the games. Why is Alexa a woman? We say this thing, we have this term at Nurka, which is called embrace otherness. If the machine would be honestly a machine, people will start to teach it. But if I see a person I don't understand, who doesn't understand me, I get pissed off. So why make facts and miles of humans? Why simulate human personality or psychology? Why don't you embrace the otherness? And I think that's a good word to end this. Thank you. So, any questions? Uh, any? Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, we actually have three projects going ongoing at the moment uh, where we are actually building like these assistants in a way, probably like <coughs> in different stages. But actually, can start. It's actually as smart as a puppy. Just write in or even hard code these micro interactions in it first. After you created the empathy, you created the persona, and then after that, it can be taught. But of course, you need to do it in the beginning, and this is why it's actually like you know raising a child. Uh, I can say no to you, or I can say hell no, or I can say no, please do it to me. You know, there's so many like, you know, lots of variants when it comes to communication and interactions that this stuff needs to be scripted at first. It doesn't need to be too complicated. Uh, when you look at, you know, a person using a service or a product, let's say 10 times, one time out of these 10 times, one of these micro interactions would happen, that would be enough. But in the future, it can be even more and more uh, strong and more and more <coughs> impressive. It's got bless you too. We had a discussion in our company Slack about when bless you, let's say seven comes out, what happens to bless you too? Your spirit are co spiritual counselor is rotting somewhere. No, but actually let's not go too deeply into robotics or assistants or personas. Let's talk about data for a little bit because this is interesting. Uh, if I would, let's say Alexa would ask me for my phone number or my bank account number or something really personal, let's say, access my like browsing history, I would say, hell no. Not in that way, I s told you last time. But if, let's say, a machine would ask me, I would actually react to it differently. There's been lots of experiments on actually how people react to computers. In the mid-60s, there was this major, in Stanford, there was this major study. And actually, like, people started to giving like, machines and the early computers names, uh, gender characteristics, and these kind of things. They were actually trying to study to nurture the machines. And once again, if it's like this science fiction cliche of uh, this hologram of an evil AI that will be our overlord, that's probably not the first way to go to. Any other questions? I started to di digress, I think. But All right, thank you very much. One question from the... Um, any comments from the, uh, the previous speakers about the... Uh, about the, uh, the data and the outcome, like, like will will there be creativity or like like if, if everything is working in a similar way, will the if the data is the same, will the outcome be the same? Or how do you feel about it? Like, are we just going to see Monet pictures <coughs> because somebody copied the the model of Monet, but how it will be?
Exactly. But I look, so look at it like this, I mean, seriously, this is super interesting because data extra extraction can become conversational and two-sided. Uh, I'm a aging middle-class hipster who lives in Töölä and I should be into this, this kind of things, right? And you can pattern me, I mean, the algorithms are super smart at the moment, but at that moment in time, I might not be. So in a way, the whole internet will will changing will be changing from like this current prediction-based models to more like these request-based models, and the request layer will be done by the users. Let's say, okay, well, Alexa, inspire me. Well, you went to this Mexican restaurant last week. Would you want to go again? Would you like to see another Mexican restaurant? And I would like to, for instance, buy. <coughs> I need to say something politically correct now. I need to buy some candy rather than go to Mexico. Do you get know what I mean? In a way, it becomes the data extraction becomes a dialogue, and that uh, actually keeps us way more valid, like you no know, portraits of the users and the audience and the consumers even. I mean, from guy from I went to the art school by the way, so don't take me too literal. Exactly, and what. And also people like to be surprised. This is why we're talking about the subjectivity. When it comes to actually like, you know, being super intelligent and be like, you know, understanding the users completely. I mean, that's really cool and all serves 95% or 90, let's say 98% of the use cases can be fulfilled by that. But if it would surprise me and make a mistake, even a calculated mistake 2% of the time, then I would have a relationship with it. Because once again, people are faulty. All of our constructs that we gravitate towards are faulty. And that's kind of like, you know, the point about having the persona and such things. <laughs>